You might know something different, but Chesapeake Old Town was somewhere in the neighborhood of today where the Yahula Creek flows into the Chesapeake River, somewhere in that vicinity. And they are going from five to twenty dollars per day and says, if this is not intruding, he doesn't know what intruding is. And he calls on me, the Cherokee agent, to prevent it. Cause and effect. What happens? General McComb, who was the Secretary of the Army at this time, or the Chief of Staff, basically writes to the commander at Fort Mitchell. Fort Mitchell was down by President Day Columbus. It was on the border of Alabama and Georgia, uh, mainly because of the Creek Nation that was located there at that time. Um, what's interesting about Fort Mitchell was that there was the 4th Infantry Regiment, the United States Army was stationed there, and these guys were all over the place. From what I can gather, they were going to Florida, they went as far as Wisconsin, and just dealing with all kinds of different activities that they were being directed to. So basically, General McComb writes to the commander at Fort Mitchell saying that you are gonna go ahead, go up to the Cherokee Nation, and get rid of these intruders that are up there. Basically, to keep the peace. They're a peacekeeping force, okay? So this is what happens next. Columbus Inquirer, March 12th of 1830. So things are starting to go pretty fast by this time. We're still in the early stages of 1830. By order of the Secretary of War, Major, and I still can't pronounce this correctly. I don't know if it's Wager or Wagger. I hate to say Major Wager because it just sounds <laughs> so weird. So Major Philip Wagger, I'll say Wagger, commander of the Fort Mitchell, instructed a proclamation on the 16th, ordering out of the Creek Nation all the white men who were not entitled to be there. So he's basically in charge of the Creek Nation also, and also to depart from the Cherokee Nation, all these guys, white people that are engaged in uh, mining for gold, digging for gold up there. And in the last couple of days in Columbus now, they're witnessing that they've got troops on the move that are going to the Cherokee Nation to get rid of these white intruders. When Major Wagger arrived in the Cherokee Nation, two locations and military posts were established close to the illegal gold mining activities. This was important. They were both known as a station, but there was the lower station located at the Sixes, near present day Canton, because there was a lot of mining activity going on there, and the upper station here, near present day area, that was called the Chastity Mines, or also the Pigeon Roost. Remember the pigeon roost. Some of you might have heard that from our gold mining history. The pigeon roost was a constant, constant source of irritation to these guys because these they wouldn't leave. How the location for the upper station was determined. This is a portion of the map of the Georgia Gold Region from 1832. So some of the information that's been placed in there would not have been there originally. This is after they had um, established the uh, the Georgia established the districts and sections and so forth but if you notice the gold diggers road which kind of started from this was been the state of Georgia with the separation line between that and the Cherokee Nation along the Chesapeake River where Testany Creek flows into the Chesapeake this was basically the invasion route if you want to use it like that this is where all these gold diggers were coming in from the state of Georgia at least one point following the road and coming up to where this is this rich gold mine, this is the pigeon roost, right here in the Cherokee Nation. This Underwood's gold mine, which was still in Hall County in the state of Georgia, because it's on the other side of the river, would have been known as the Calhoun gold mine. Everybody knows what the Calhoun gold mine is today, but that would have been called Underwood's at that time, because Calhoun had not had purchased that or gotten involved with it yet. The star is approximately where the station would have been situated. Now, at this point, there is no mention or indication that the troops were involved in building forts or stockades or any type of structure. Does anyone want to venture a guess on why that might be? Number one, they were spending too much time in the field. They were only there as a temporary force. They weren't there to go ahead and start building a fort in the nation and be there permanently. They were there as a temporary force, kick these guys back across the river, out of the nation, keep the peace, and go home hopefully sooner than later, but that did not work out to be the case. So big picture, May of 1830, Congress passes the Indian Removal Act, which I'm sure many of you might be familiar with. This basically said that um, Andrew Jackson uh, had the Congress pass the bill to remove all Indian nations that were living in the United States, you know, west of the Mississippi River. 
Conveniently, a few days later, Governor Gilmer issued a proclamation also, which basically said that, well, wait a second now, we didn't ask for federal troops to come into the state of Georgia. We're saying that the Cherokee Nation, and it has all this wealth that we're finding, within the boundaries of the state of Georgia belongs to us. And so it's illegal to mine for gold right there. And so we're gonna extend our authority over the Cherokee Nation into this area. And as an extra added bonus, we're gonna make things even more complicated because now we're gonna send in Georgia militia. So now you've got two military forces, military um, type troops, Georgia militia and the federal troops going off and on trying to kick these white gold diggers out of the Cherokee Nation. So now you got everybody's running around in this area right there, which is making it a little even more confusing. In September of 1830, now, from what I've been able to determine, Major Wagger, with his troops, were not totally occupied right there uh, at the station during this whole time. It sounds like they were kind of going back and forth. So the initial time they went in there, there wasn't that many uh, white trespassers in the nation. They kicked them out, but these guys kept coming back. There was not enough troops to maintain this. You know, they're back and forth like the Keystone Cops trying to get rid of these diggers. We get rid of some of these guys and then we'll replace them. It was just like trying to stick your finger in the dike and stop the water because these guys, they kept coming back. And again, the pigeon roost was that constant source of irritation where these guys kept coming to because there was a lot of gold that was coming out of there. We don't know exactly how much, but we know that they were finding gold there. So in September of 1830, Major Wagger decided, I've had enough of this. I need more troops. So they decided to requisition more troops to come from different locations right there. And you'll see, it says that the station in the Cherokee Nation will be reinforced by companies from Charleston and Augusta. And Major Wagger assumes command of the post. So he's in charge of this whole operation right here, this base of operations of the <coughs> Cherokee Nation. The object of this augmentation of force in the Cherokee Nation is to displace the gold diggers and aid the authorities of Georgia. That's important. They're going to aid the authorities of Georgia in executing the laws of the state over the Cherokee Territory. So now it's like making the U.S. troops, we're the bad guys. We started off as being this peacekeeping force trying to get rid of these guys, and now we're helping Georgia, you know, to get rid of these diggers right there. It's because they're exercising their rights over the state. So this is what's really interesting. Okay, at this point, I have our handouts. We've got two versions of what happened here on September 17th, 1830. And this, to me, was very crucial. Our first version of what happened came from the Georgia Courier, dated October 4th, 1830. And basically it says, every person engaged in the digging in the Cherokee country has been driven out by the troops who amount to upwards of 300 strong. So there's about 300 troops under the command of Major Wagner. Nearly 200 prisoners were taken and kept in confinement one day and one night and then driven out of the nation. Notice the language here. This language that they're using is very important and in some ways it's almost prophetic about what happens with the Cherokee removal uh, years later. Some of the Georgians who were taken complained of very harsh treatment such as being whipped and beaten with swords. The excitement in Hall County against the officers of this detachment of troops in the nation is strong, and threats have been made of men sufficient to drive them from the country, but we have been informed that this is supposed nothing of the kind will be attempted. So basically, these troops went in there, treated these guys bad, kicked them out, you know, even after confining them, after they rounded them up uh, and kept them there. So that was just kind of a generic version, the white version of what happened that was reported in the paper. Second version, which you have in front of you, was very, to me, this was almost like the holy grail of some of this stuff. Um, this was just a portion of what you're reading right there, and the reason I transcribed it and typed it up was because I wanted to make sure everybody could read this, because it was very interesting. You'll notice, this came from the Cherokee Phoenix, and it was written by Walter Adair. Does anybody know who Walter Adair was? Prominent Cherokee leader. Um, I believe he was a Cherokee congressman and also was a judge on the Cherokee court at one time. And so this was written, published January 1st, 1831, months after the fact. And if we read this, it says, for the benefit of our people watching on Zoom, since they don't have a copy of this, this communication did not reach us until the other day. We feel much indebted to the author for using his proper signature. This is being written by the Cherokee Phoenix. 
It is not to be doubted that the visit of the troops has been oppressive to many of the citizens of the nation. The blame lies where the writer places it, at the door of the executive. With some of the under officers, we became acquainted while they were in the nation. For their gentleman behavior, we hold them in high regards. High regard. So I'm assuming when he says under officers that he's talking about some of the junior officers that were involved in this. And so it's dated October 10th, 1830, Cherokee Nation, Chesapeake Gold Mines. Mr. Editor, sir, I have been for some time expected that the person better qualified than myself would have communicated the result of the late visit of the United States troops to this place on the 17th of September, but I have been disappointed. Permit me therefore through the columns of the Phoenix exhibit to the world one instance of oppression which is the legitimate offspring of the unfatherly policy of the general government towards the Cherokees. But pen and ink will almost fail to describe the shameful, outrageous conduct of the troops. The Cherokees who were peacefully gleaning gold on their own soil, after many thousands of white intruders from different states who were daily stealing the precious metal from their rightful owners, news reached us that the United States troops were on the march to that place. The natives rejoiced, vainly, hoping to realize the often promised but slow delayed protection. But soon, very soon, their hopes were all blasted, and the rejoicing turned to sorrow. When the troops made their appearance on the summits of the pigeon roost, darn that pigeon roost again, one of the principal mines in the region, commanded by Major Wagner, who made a charge with considerable shouting and the clashing of firearms, as if determined to sweep for the gold diggers with relentless destruction. Many of the white intruders, fearful of suffering incited punishment, ingloriously fled to the mountains, gave leg bail for security. But the Cherokees, who once valiantly fought and bled by the hero's side, being conscious of not having violated the laws of the United States, or any individual states, stood firm. I mean, they're still in Cherokee Nation. And with almost unexampled patience, suffered the depredations and lawless violence of the troops, believing that it was much more honorable to suffer oppression than to be the cruel oppressor. The Cherokees and the white intruders were all made prisoners, ordered into ranks, and marched off to the encampment about one mile distant. While they were kept closely confined in a house without anything to eat or drink for a space of 24 hours. So this kind of goes along with the other reference there that these guys were uh, confined in some type of a building. Many of the natives were shamefully treated. Some of them who did not understand the command of the officers were beaten with the butts of their guns and shoved into ranks by force. The soldiers, without restraint, were permitted to rob them of what gold they had and would thrust their hands into their pockets and take what they could find. Some few saved their gold by hiding it in their moccasins and other unsuspected places. Much property, much property belonging to the Indians was destroyed. All working utensils were forcibly taken from them, their gold, washing machines burned, means gold mining, gold washing machines, and mashed to pieces. One belonged to a Mr. Daniel Davis, a native supposed to be worth $300. One house belonging to a Cherokee was also burned up. A storehouse belonging to a native had the lock broken by the soldiers and was forcibly entered. And a quantity of groceries, goods, gold, and money to the amount of also $300 was destroyed. They came to Reuben Daniels. I'm gonna slow down now. They came to Reuben Daniels the evening before they committed this shameful robbery, preemptorily ordered him out of his house, which was a large frame building, before he could arrange his business so as to remove his effects. The soldiers were ordered to take his goods and chattels out into the yard, there to lie until he could take them away elsewhere. The troops then took possession of his house and still occupy it. The troops took possession of his house and still occupy it. I am disposed to believe that as such flagrant as these have been committed upon any other people except the Cherokees or others similar, similarly circumstanced, it would have been considered a palpable infringement upon the Constitution of the United States, which very expressly says in the amendment, Article 3, no soldiers shall in time of peace be quartered in any house without the consent of the owner, nor in time of war, but in a manner to be prescribed by law. 
They also destroyed Mr. Samuel May's groceries, a citizen of this nation, stopped his wagon and team on the road when he, he was on his way home from the mines. The soldiers were also suffered to plunder his wagon and broke open his trunks. Quantities of goods and wearing clothes were taken and a pocketbook with money in it. However, shame overcame the officers who afterwards paid Mrs. Mays $20 as a compensation for damages committed on her property, although it was a trifle compared to the amount taken. So, without reading the rest of it right there, you get the gist of what happened right here. They were confined and then ordered out. But the crucial part, the crucial part from this eyewitness account says that these troops occupied a house, this Reuben Daniels house, nice framed house, and they were still there as far as Mr. Adair knew at the writing of this. That's very important. What happened later as a result of this was that by November, Major Wagger had basically been ordered to take his troops and retire for, to winter quarters. Basically, we don't need you anymore. Go back down to Fort Mitchell. And then by 1831, our timeline shows that federal troops leave the nation by 1830. Georgia militia now assumes responsibility of removing the gold diggers from the Cherokee Nation. And so from what I have been able to find, there is no, in any of the newspapers or anything else, there's no later mention of the station being used by the Georgia militia or at a later date. So big picture right here, kind of skipping forward, because this is gonna kind of end our portion talking about the station for the time being. 1831, Wilson governor was elected governor in Georgia. December of the same year, state of Georgia claims the Cherokee Nation when it's within its borders belongs to Georgia and therefore creates Cherokee County. So it's no longer Cherokee Nation, now it's all part of Georgia, but it's one big county, Cherokee County. 1832, Georgia surveyors, they parcel up the Cherokee Nation into districts, sections, and land lots. They hold the 1832 land lottery, and then 10 counties are created and divvied up from the former Cherokee Nation. Lumpkin County is one of these new counties that was established out of the nation. 1833, the town of Talonega, later changed to Dahlonega, is established as the county seat of Lumpkin County. 1833, Jackson was re-elected as president. 1835, uh, we have the Treaty of New Echota. William Schley was elected governor of Georgia. 1835, the Branch Mint Bill was established, which established branch, branch mints in Charlotte, Dahlonega, and New Orleans. Construction of the mint begins in 1836, and then 1837, Martin Van Buren is elected president, and in Georgia, George Gilmer is elected as the governor. So that kind of goes from real fast from after they left the station at the end of 1830 up to the time of the development, establishment of Lumpkin County, the mint, and also moving forward to 1837 as we get closer to the time of the actual removal. So kind of switching gears, going into the portion now about Fort Floyd. This was a map that shows basically the overall location of the removal forts within the state of Georgia, just prior to and up to the time of the actual removal. And take note that you don't see these removal forts really, really close to each other. For the most part, they're separated like, you know, within different counties. Um, from what I can gather, they were located um, either close to a town or someplace where there was a larger settlement of Cherokees that they would need to establish a fort in that area in order to round them up um, for deportation. Now, the big question is, and I know I've had a lot of questions about this in the past, and I worked with Ken Akins uh, a few years ago trying to establish where the location of Fort Floyd might have been. And this still is still kind of a mystery. We don't really know exactly where Fort Floyd was. This was interesting. I found this, um, we had a program for the Historical Society on the history of the Dahlonega Mint uh, on Thursday. And this was brought to my attention. I had never seen this before, but thought it was interesting to include because it shows the layout of not just the town, but the adjacent lots in Dahlonega in 1835. And where are we going? See, here was the town, the layout of it for the downtown. So this area right here would be, had been where the, um, the courthouse was located. And 
the different letters which you see around here were potential sites of where they thought maybe the, a good place to put the mint might be. Now in 1835, they hadn't built the mint yet. They had that mint bill which was passed. And the reason that they did this was basically, they had gold that they had found in North Carolina prior to Georgia uh, in 1799 and moving forward around the Mecklenburg, you know, Charlotte area. And then obviously here in Georgia uh, by 1829 and moving forward. So why would you put branch mints of the United States in two small kind of out of the way towns? Well, up until this time, the branch or the mint of the United States was located in Philadelphia. And so that would have been a very long trip, took a long time, maybe dangerous. Uh, there was no railroads at this time, obviously. It would have been either by ship or overland to get to Philadelphia with any gold that you might have had to deposit. So rather than have the miners with the gold go to the mint, let's bring the mint to the miners. So that was one of the reasons that Dahlonega, even though it was so isolated, was chosen since this was kind of the hub of the gold mining activity in this area in Georgia. So number three, right down here, uh, that's actually gonna become the site of where the, what was actually chosen where the Mint, Price Memorial Building is located today. But you also notice that they do have these little circles right here. These indicates, or indicate high ground or hills. So that I thought was kind of interesting because that's one place that militarily you might choose to put a fort. So clues to locations of where Fort Floyd, Fort Floyd may have been. Um, one of our first indications about the apprehension that they had about the Mint was that November 16th of 1837, uh, this comes from Dr. Sarah Hill, if any of you know her, she had sent me, and I thank her for that, a chronology of Fort Floyd. So I've got little excerpts of these day-to-day correspondence between the military that was here and other places up until the time of the removal about what was going on. So we see the Secretary of War, Colonel William Lindsay, in Athens, Tennessee, he has a note of a letter from the branch mint of Dahlonega. I have to request that you will give your attention to the unprotected condition of that institution and take measures which may at any time be necessary for its defense during the continuance of the Cherokees in the section where they are now. So what it sounds like is that Superintendent J.J. Singleton has a little bit of apprehension about you know where the mint is. This is from January 12, 1838, so five months, beginning of January, five months before the removal begins. Um, and this is from Milledgeville, the headquarters. The Commander-in-Chief has received a call from Colonel Lindsay of the United States Army for a company of infantry to be drawn from some other part of the state than that which is occupied by the Cherokees to be stationed at present in Dahlonega, Lumpkin County, and designed for the protection of the people against apprehended Indian hostility. So basically they're saying, we need some infantry, we need some help up here in Dahlonega because you know, if this removal actually takes place here, you know, something might go south here. So we're kind of concerned about that. And here we have other letters, correspondence going back. February of 1838, J.J. Singleton prints an article in the newspaper and basically said that the Dahlonega branch mint is completed. We're ready for operations. You're all invited to come and check it out. Now, what does this mean to the United States? You've got this mint located out here in the middle of nowhere and they spent upwards of I don't know how many thousands of dollars to construct this investment. This is an investment for the United States. We don't want to have something happen to this investment because we just spent this thousands of dollars here with all this gold down there in Georgia, we don't want something to happen to it. So keeping that in mind, that would be a good reason why you might want to have this fort located close to the Mint to protect that investment of the United States. So we see these different letters talking about what was going on between January, February, 1838. And as you see what I underlined up here, an absolute necessity for protection of public property here. Mint will commence operations soon first place of attack if the Indians become hostile. So there's this apprehension there. By February 17th, we've got this uh, A.M. Julian camp 
He's at the camp near Dahlonega. I received appointment as the quartermaster from General Vaughn, and he arrived on the 10th with Captain Peake's company. The first troops to come in here were actually Tennessee volunteers. Captain Peake's company had come from Tennessee to Dahlonega for a short time until they could get more troops here. And he has taken a position as near to the Mint as he could find for command of wood and water. Doesn't give us an exact location, but again, this is a clue. Took a position near the Mint. What's near me? I mean, near is kind of a relative term. Is near like a mile? Is it like, you know, a couple hundred yards? I don't know. But he's close to the Mint somewhere. February 26th. Branch Mint to the Governor Gilmer. So again, um, James Jefferson Singleton, who's the superintendent of the Mint, is writing to George Gilmer of Georgia regarding your questions. Cannot answer your inquiry about the safety of the citizens here. Indians are now peaceful, but for how long? Question mark. They are vengeful people opposed to the treaty. Have not heard of any planned hostilities, but look back to the scenes of Roanoke and other depredations. Probable danger before time of removal probably 1,000 well-armed men throughout the country, enough to affect the treaty. Have not heard of three companies ordered into the Cherokee Company, meaning infantry companies, destined for this place have not yet arrived. So basically, he's writing these apprehensions and it sounds like he's kind of playing it up. And he's you know trying to create these images, you know, like, well, you know, something could really happen bad here if you don't get these troops here, you know, quickly. You know, because we got this mint and, you know, there's like 1,000 people and there might not have been even close to that many. Brief chronology moving forward in Fort Floyd from February to April, so just prior to the removal. Um, and I've got pages here that Dr. Hill had sent me of this you know, Fort Floyd chronology, so these are just some of the high points that I wanted to point out. Uh, much of the military correspondence <laughs> during this period reflects the many questions and confusion regarding the issue of supplies and transportation to and from different locations, not just Fort Floyd, but other you know, removal forts. Basically, how are we going to supply this? Who's in charge of all these different things? There's arguments about within the units, who's going to be uh, in charge. Squabbles about leadership. Um, the first company to arrive of troops was about February 10th. I mentioned that. That was Captain Peake's Tennessee Volunteer Company. Um, Captain Peake's company was relieved on March 13th by Captain Benjamin Cleveland, who writes from Camp Dahlonega. Camp Dahlonega. March 22nd, Cleveland writes to Governor Gilmer, has received orders to form an encampment in the vicinity of Dahlonega, and, even more interesting, another clue, placed arms, ordnance, and ammunition in part of the brick courthouse. So the courthouse, for a short time, was being used to store ammunition and weapons and so forth. Additional supplies and subsistence items continue to arrive in and around Dahlonega. April 3rd, uh, our correspondence first uses the term cantonment Dahlonega, and on the same day, in a separate letter, actually says Dahlonega Fort Floyd. So this was the first time that it's mentioned Fort Floyd. April 16th, Captain Cleveland writes to Governor Gilmer that he has received orders from Colonel Lindsay, who is basically above him, tending to erect barracks for the accommodation of the company for the purpose of preserving their health and he shall attend to that. So this is where we first start seeing that it goes from being a camp, at least in writing, that we're improving this, we're building something here. That I thought was crucial. Again, but it still doesn't give us the exact location. What's important here also, I wanted to point out, three different um, clippings about General Winfield Scott talk about General Winfield Scott being the commander of this whole operation. He was. He's very capable. He had come from uh, fighting with the Seminoles down in Florida, went to Charleston, eventually moved to Augusta, and finally to his headquarters in Athens, Tennessee. Athens, Tennessee is where General Winfield Scott's headquarters was, and it's in all these writings. At no time was Winfield Scott in Georgia during the removal. The closest he ever got from what I could find was Ross's Landing, present-day Chattanooga to oversee some of these transports on ships, boats, from Cherokees moving west. His headquarters was in Athens, Tennessee, and this is what you need to remember. He had, this is how it was broken down. They had different military districts and commanders, middle, eastern, and western. 
and it had, he had sub, sub, subordinate commanders. If you've been in the military, you know how this works. You got the commander in chief, you know, your chain of command, and then you got other commanders in charge of different areas right there. Winfield Scott had no reason to come to Georgia. He had no reason to go to any other place. He was at his headquarters in Tennessee, and everybody was reporting to him. Makes sense, because that was your fixed location. Everybody's feeding you the information about how well or any issues you might be having with the removal. And all these different articles reflect that, that his headquarters was in Athens, Tennessee. On May 26, we know that uh, General Scott issued the order to begin the forced removal in the Cherokee Nation. This was interesting because it was written from Auraria, May 31, 1838. And it was written by MHG, who I assume is Milton H. Gathright, who was the publisher of the Dahlonega newspaper, The Miner's Recorder and Spy in the West. And basically said that he's been riding with the troops and he just arrived in Auraria and has a quick amount of time to write before the post office closes there to write a letter and inform everybody about how things are going. And he writes that on Monday last, according to the orders of General Scott, the troops in the counties of Cherokee, Forsyth, Gilmer, and Lumpkin made a simultaneous move upon the Cherokees. And I'm highly pleased to inform you that they have succeeded beyond the most sanguine expectations in collecting every Cherokee, man, woman, and child in those counties, not, not just here, but in all those four counties, amounting to about 15 or 1600 with little or no trouble whatsoever. The other counties of the Cherokee country I have not heard from. The Cherokees are all secured in forts at different locations or different posts in the country where they will remain until further orders from headquarters. So, as we see by May 31st, um, Gathright saying that basically the mission, the operation has been completed. They've secured all their prisoners in these forts at the different locations awaiting transportation or orders. How many Cherokees may have been held at Fort Floyd? This is a good question because I don't actually know. What I can tell you from the chronology of Fort Floyd is that there were four separate entries to show that on June 24th, that they paid, the quartermaster paid for a wagon team hired by four different individuals to hire a team of transportation of Indian prisoners and baggage at Fort Floyd, Georgia to Ross's Landing for 18 days. Um, it varies slightly, one's 19 days, one's 20 days. But basically it's saying that they hired four different separate teams of wagons to help transport prisoners, baggage, and so forth there up to Ross's Landing. So it's basically to and from uh, Ross's Landing to move the prisoners there. But we don't know an exact number. But that's evidence that we know that Delaniga was used as a removal location. And again, I found this, I thought it was kind of interesting to include because we don't really know what the fort may have looked like. Um, this was an artist's conception that I found online of how a fort of that time may have looked like. Maybe not exactly, but I'm sure that Fort Floyd would have had certain elements uh, or similarities to this illustration right there. Remember, this was something that would have been built very quickly. And so um, whatever troops you might have had available, maybe even slave labor, that was not probably going to be unheard of, to build just a quick enclosure in order to put these prisoners in, make sure they couldn't get away, and then guard them until such time as we can get them out of here, and then it's going to be over. By mid-June of 1838, the Cherokee removal was complete within Georgia. Volunteer units were paid and mustered out of service. The quartermasters were authorized to hold public sales on behalf of the government of items which were no longer needed. Since Fort Floyd had been recently built, no longer had a military necessity, it would make sense that um, common use items such as nails, wood, so on, for the construction of a fort, stockade, or a barracks could be repurposed. You know, somebody takes the wood, nails, what have you, and uses it for the construction of a house, fence, what have you. So you got common use items right there. But again, we don't know the exact location or what all was used in the construction of this uh, fort. Um, this was from the Cherokee Agency. Again, this was up in Tennessee from the headquarters. Major pain uh, may also cause to be sold and accounted for such property in the quartermasters and commissary department to be advantageous to the United States. So basically it's saying that 
this is just one example of that. We don't need this stuff anymore. The, the Cherokee removal is complete. They've been sent away. We need to get rid of this stuff and then we can go on and do other business then. Um, so militarily, we don't have a use for this anymore. We can sell it, maybe make some money off of it, and then we're gonna you know, finish this. Captain Cleveland's company at Dahlonega will be discharged at the discretion of Brigadier General Eustace, given the notice to the paymasters above mentioned, and he will remain or re retain Captain Derrick's company of Georgians for further orders. So this was at Dahlonega. So even though this was in June, they were still keeping, Captain Derrick had a company of cavalry, which was stationed here, Georgia Volunteers. They were still gonna keep them hanging around just in case there might be something else going on that they might need them for. Um, but they were eventually discharged a short time later after this was complete. Now, possible locations of where Fort Floyd may have, be, may have been uh, and I know this is important because a lot of folks will want to erect, you know, in the future, a possible historical marker for Fort Floyd. So that way people know what went on here during the Cherokee removal. Um, and these are just a couple of possible locations. Price Memorial, the former mint building, obviously that was cited on more than one uh, reference. The Lumpkin County Courthouse in the center of town. Maybe, maybe not. That might have been where Fort Floyd was at because you don't want to have that many troops in the center of the town right there. It's better to have them kind of on the, on the outskirts. The mustering grounds, there, does everyone know where the mustering grounds um, historical marker is located? It's right near Hawkins and North Grove Street. There's like an apartment complex that's there today. That might have been a location because I know from the history that's written on the marker, it says the mustering grounds were used for a number of years for different militia, for, for marching, you know, practicing military things, stuff like that. But was it, that old, did it go back to that time period? I don't know. Other locations. One that I was looking at just last weekend that would have been a possibility was the area where the Dahlonega Baptist Church is located at. If you go up there and stand in the parking lot, you can look right across even with the trees right now and see the steeple from Price Memorial. And that kind of makes sense because it's a nice flat area. There is a small stream running behind that. So, you know, from a military standpoint, there's things that you want to look for that would be advantageous in order to place an encampment, fort, what have you. Um, high ground, it overlooks the town. It would have been a very short two minute march maybe if they needed to get called out like they were talking about these apprehensions about Indian attacks uh, at the Mint. So if you had a body of troops that close to the Mint but yet you know, we're still far enough away that we can kind of keep an eye and overwatch things, might be a little possible location. The bottom line is that so much construction, excavations, things have taken place in the past almost 180, 190 years since the town was established, there's no way of finding this. Plus, the problem with Fort Floyd, why it remains an enigma, is that there wasn't too much written about it. Um, and that becomes a problem. We talk about narratives about the station. Something that occurred to me today was that we never had a library in Dahlonega until 1918. So prior to having a library, any sources of information that we had about the history of what happened here before would have been maybe in the newspaper, word of mouth, you know, passed down, what have you. Um, so about the station, here's where things kind of get muddled. I found four different references from the 20th century that talk about the station. The first one came from Colonel Price, William P. Price. And this was first published in the Nugget on March 5th, 1903, in which he's talking about uh, the military, history of the military and volunteer militia and things like that uh, around Dahlonega. The same story is repeated in Kane's history uh, of Lumpkin County from 1832 to 1932. I'm gonna read that in a second. Um, the second one comes from George's Landmarks, Memorials, and Legends by Lucian Lamar Knight, who was a state historian. This was written in 1914. And what he wrote in this was that, just a brief things talking about Lumpkin County and Auraria and so on, some of the history, is that at Auraria sleep the remains of a noted woman of this section, Mrs. Agnes Pascal. Um, going on down, he's talking about Auraria, some of the things that are out there. And he says, one mile this side is a heap of stones in a cornfield that marks the place where General Winfield Scott's headquarters, when he was sent here to remove the Cherokee to the west, it was called the station and remained there until recent years. This was in 1914 that this was written. So 
So our next reference again comes from Cain's history. And there's two references to the station in Cain's history. The first one, it talks about reminiscences of a Miss Fanny Wood. And it basically said that the things related by Miss Wood were practically all told to her by others, but she has an excellent memory and related to the writer these following stories. And she talks about, um, where is it here? There used, to, there used to be many people in and about Agraria, all the way from the station a mile north to Wells Place at the old burnt stand just a half a mile. And she talks about Guy Rivers Cave and so on there. Uh, you know the place they call the station a mile north of Agraria on the Delatica Road. Well, General Scott was stationed there at the time of the intrusion. He was actually there, for I have heard my mother say she saw him many a time. The soldiers were there for the purpose of keeping peace while they were getting the Indians away and guarding the gold mines. I don't know whether they had any sort of fort. That old house was Scott's headquarters. The old chimney is there now, or at least a sign of the chimney. So that was passed down. This was secondhand information. She didn't actually see this or know about it. It was told to her uh, by her other people that lived out there. Colonel Price wrote, and this is what I had a hard time with, was that Colonel Price wrote this first letter that Cain talks about on March 5th, 1903 in the Delonega Nugget. And he's talking about something that happened when he was three or four years old. When he wrote this, he was 68 years old. So my question would have to be, how good was his memory about the events that he was remembering that happened you know, many, many years ago? The one thing that was kind of distressing was that he talks about when his father died in April of 1839, there was a thousand troops, men, that came there for his funeral. If you go in the cemetery, Colonel Price's father, it says his date of death is April 11th, 1838. That's a month before the removal happened. And Colonel Price wrote that his father was an officer that helped with the removal to the West. If they got the year wrong on the, on the headstone, that's a possibility. But if his father actually died a year, be, you know, a month before the, uh, the removal took place, he couldn't have participated in it. And I know he wasn't an officer because I found that he was actually in Captain Derrick's cavalry company, and he was at least the rank of second sergeant um, from military records right now. Um, so, what I think might have happened somewhere down along the line is that these stories got muddled. You've got two different locations, two different <coughs> forts, or two different time frames, and somehow they merged into one. I don't know why, but for Fort Floyd, there's no references to Fort Floyd that I have found from the 19th century, 20th century, until I found this one from Sarah Hill that she had written about Cherokee removal forts. And that was basically because she found records in Washington at the National Archives with this correspondence that I had uh, referenced right there. My military titles would matter when we talk about the station versus a fort. This is different excerpts from a military dictionary in English and French that was published in London. This was a which was fourth edition, published in 1816. Officers would be very conscious about when they were writing correspondence back and forth to each other about the title or where they were at, an encampment, a catonement, a fort, and so on right there, because in their minds, okay, that's letting me know what type of situation you are in, what type of um, place, um, you know, militarily. And it says from the dictionary, a military station, by definition, is a place calculated for the rendezvous of troops the distribution of them, moving them back and forth, also a spot for well ca calculated for offensive or defensive measures. Doesn't mention anything in the definition of a station about a fort, an enclosure, something built. It just says a place for the rendezvous of troops, the distribution of them. A post, people always use the word post. Where are you posted at? Even today we use that kind of terminology in the military. You know, where are you stationed at? A post in war is a military station. Any sort of ground, ground, fortified or not, where a body of men can be in a condition of resisting the enemy. Again, it does not say anything about a structure, building, something that's above the ground. It says fortified ground. That could be adding defensive measures, digging trenches, things like that, not building a fort. 
That's something different. Contonement, contonement Floyd, Floyd or contonement Dahlonega was used once in the Fort Floyd chronology. And a contonement area, I thought that was distinctive because it says it's a situation in a town or village. Different parts of the army lie as near or as close to each other as possible in the same manner as they encamp in the field. So basically, if you're with an army, group of troops out in the field, you know, there's a certain way that you set up. Contonement, you're closer to a town. That's why it would have used that terminology when it talks about contonement Delania. They were on the outskirts or close to the town. So that means that we're bringing the army closer to town for that protection of the town and the men, probably. Uh, and that's why it would have had the name contonement. And then fort, there's a lot of definitions that goes down under fort, different types of forts, but this was like kind of the generic uh, version of it, explanation. A small fortified place, environed on all sides, enclosed, with a ditch, rampart, or parapet. Its uses are to secure high ground or the passage of a river, or to make good and advantageous post to defend the lines and quarters of a siege and so on there. So basically to secure some type of high ground. That's what I thought was kind of crucial when we talk about a fort. Fort Floyd would have probably been on some type of a high ground in order to overwatch, like I said, the town or the mint right there. You wouldn't put it in a low area because of swampy, you know, you get fired upon, things like that. So when you, as a military commander or taking into consideration from a military standpoint, select locations, it's very important that you do that, and the terminology that you're going to be used in correspondence is also going to match that. So in summary, um, the station and Fort Floyd both existed, both had separate functions and were used during different years. They were both designed to be temporary military outposts. They had distinct different locations, and sadly, little to no known physical evidence exists. Military correspondence and news articles from 1838 never mention or hint at a removal fort or military post near Auraria. For command and control purposes, as well as logistics, there would have been no need for two military encampments within five miles of each other between Dahlonega to Auraria. It doesn't make military sense. Why do you need two? You got, you got supply two, you got to have troops for two. It's much easier. Just put them all in one location right there. It's easiest from one location right there. So, now we come to the end of our program. Questions, comments, observations? I, think where I know it's a lot of information. But <laughs> I think where you're talking about where it could be is down from the Baptist Church, down by the theater, because that was a branch down through there. It was called Hanyard Branch. Correct. Yes. And it was possible there, and there was also a gold mine, which is in the Smith House, right there. So it could have been in that, right there where that is, is where I think maybe Fort Floyd is. Okay. John, do you have a question? Um, the historical marker, did you get a copy of the application or whatever? How, how was that put there, one down on the very road to the station? The station marker? Yes. Yeah. Um, this was erected in 1953, and I, I had this question. I, I contacted the Georgia Historical Society because they are the entity that's now responsible for all these historical markers around the state. And